in our series, uh, hashtag wisdom. We've been going through the book of Proverbs. And if you've noticed, and as if you've been reading through the book of Proverbs, you've ever read through the book of Proverbs, it is very scattered as far as theme goes. Like it's all over the place, especially once you get in past like chapter 8, 9, 10, and then the rest of the book, you read one verse about one thing, and then the next verse will become something completely different topic. And so um, it goes pops all over, but as you look at the whole, uh, you get a, just a lot of wisdom from the second wisest man who ever walked on the earth. Jesus being the first, Solomon being the second, and uh, so he wrote down these sayings, and uh, so we've been using this idea of hashtags because if you don't know what those are, it's just a social media term that, uh, or that, that's a uh, thing that's used in social media that groups a bunch of things together of the same uh, topic, and so... Um, You've probably seen it, unless you buried, you know, you bury your head under a rock, this idea of a hashtag. It's this little, it used to be a pound sign, for those of you guys who had home phones. Um, but uh, it's just a way of categorizing things. And so what we're doing is taking all these different uh, verses in the book of Proverbs, or categorizing them, and, and talking about the wisdom that God's word provides for us. And it's been a fun series. It's always a fun series. It's always a fun time to do walk through the book of Proverbs together because I feel like whether you're sitting there or you're preaching the messages, there's so, so much to learn from the book of Proverbs. Um, and as we've walked through them, man, the amount that I have been convicted and been challenged by as we've walked through Proverbs has been amazing. And so we've been walking through getting, uh, un um, understanding the direction that God wants us to walk in life. That's, that was week one. We talked about, um, friendships and having wise friendships and how to build wise friendships. We talked about uh, understanding our soul and what our soul is and some pro Proverbs gives us an insight into our souls. And then last week, Jason did a great job talking about how we use our mouth and how we speak to one another. And uh, this week, um, we're going to talk about uh, marriage and the marriage relationships um, and, and what we see in the book of Proverbs. Um, and as we dive into this topic of marriage, I understand as I dive into it, um, and, and I'm completely aware of this, that we all come into this in, from different places. Uh, some of us in here are, some of you are not married yet, um, or, or uh, are not married right now. And, and so I understand that, that it's a temptation to just be like, well, this doesn't mess, the message doesn't apply to me, I'll just kind of write it off. Um, this was, the, this was the week to, that I should have been in a kid's class or something like that. Um, so, uh, but, but I understand that. I understand that, that there are single people in here and that, that God, um, that there's actually a tremendous blessing to singleness. And the Bible talks a lot about singleness in, in a very positive way. And so, um, so we will talk about that uh, one day is the singleness aspect of this. And I understand that, that, that as we talk about marriage and sometimes as you walk into churches, if you are single, it's kind of a weird spot to be in because a lot of people are married and, and, and have kids. And, um, and so I understand that there's some of this that, that's kind of be, that today is a little bit exclusive, it seems, because we're, we're not talking to that. But the Bible's still very full of wisdom f on marriage. And so in order to preach the whole counsel of God, we have to preach about marriage. And the second thing I want to say to you is if you are one day planning on being married, um, I learned so, so much um, while I was single in Bible college, I learned so much about marriage that blessed me uh, in my first years of marriage. Um, but I learned all of, a lot of that while I was single. So don't just disregard everything if one day you plan on being married. The other thing I realize as I talk to a group of people here today is that we all come into this in different spots in our marriage. Some of you have been married a long time. Some of you have been, are in your second marriage. Some of you have struggled in marriage. Some of you are uh, doing great in marriage. Some of you uh, are a little bit even resistant to me preaching about this because you're like, I don't know what he's going to talk about. You have no idea idea what my marriage looks like and don't even pretend to know, right? Uh, and then when I, I, I doubled down, and trust me, I know, I doubled down this week and I titled this The Dream Marriage and some of you are like, that's not even possible. Do you know my spouse? <laughs> and so some of you walked in, you looked at the bullets and you're like, 
prove it to me, Joel. Um, so I understand that this is what we're against this morning, and, and this hasn't escaped me, right? Uh, I know that, that when we come into this idea of marriage, that, that there's a lot of different um, spots that we walk into this about. But what I will say is this, it doesn't make God's word any less true, no matter how you walked in this morning. And so what we're going to walk through is God's word today, and the book of Proverbs provides some interesting insights into marriage, and because marriage was God's idea in the first place, and it was his idea. Before we jump into Proverbs, though, you guys um, are aware that, that in our culture, right, we got these, like, like power couples, they call them. Like, if you're into the TMZ world at all, I'm not, but I hear these, like, if you walk through the checkout line and you see all the little tabloids and all that stuff, like, you got these power couples, right? Like, um, like Jay-Z and Beyonce, right? They're a power couple, right? Everybody looks at them and sees what they're doing, tracks them, the paparazzi. I'm losing all of you guys right now. Uh, Alex Rodriguez and J-Lo, right? They're a, a power couple in our culture. Everybody kind of sees what they're doing. Uh, Kanye West and Kim Kardashian. I had to look these up yesterday because it changes every like day who's together and who's not if you read the tabloids. Uh, Tom Brady and, and Giselle, uh, Russell Wilson and Sierra are, are the power couple from across the pond, Prince William and Kate Middleton, right? You guys know that name, at least, the power couple from across the pond. Uh, and, and it's funny that, that everybody kind of, that, that a lot of our culture looks at them, these couples, and they're like, oh, Oh, what's their life like? And there are people, I promise you this, and I don't believe it I, I, unless you, you, you know it's truth because you stand in checkout lines and you read all, you, you see all those dumb articles that are in all those magazines right there about what's the latest and greatest drama. And there are people whose whole career is to follow these people around and take pictures of them and get into all their business. You've missed your career calling, friends. <laughs> right? And, and whether it's not these, these popular, quote-unquote, power couples of our culture, pop culture, whatever, or whether it's not, it, it, we tend to look at relationships and we, we want to emulate parts of them. Or, or we say, well, they, they seem like they've got it all together. Or we see different shows or different things that prop people up and different, and they say, wow, look at them. They have it. They have all the looks and all the fame and all the money and all the, all the problems. It's what we don't see. But we have this idea in our culture and there's this, uh, we're not too far off because really um, God designed these, not power couples, but he gave us these examples in scripture of these dream couples, we'll call them, dream couples. And they didn't have it all together, but God uses them in scripture to show us and teach us. And we find one of those in the last uh, chapter of the book of Proverbs. And you want to turn there, you can, as we just kind of get rolling in this. But as you're turning to the book of, the end of chapter 31 of the book of Proverbs, as we, before we get to them as a dream couple, I'd like to go back to the very first dream couple. And it was, of course, Adam and Eve, right? And God created mankind, and he was, he created the world, and if you read Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, right, God's in the process of creating all things and, and creation and, and animals, and he creates Adam, and he, he gives Adam this charge to, to name all the animals, right, and so Adam begins, and all the animals start coming, and Adam begins noticing uh, a pattern that, that there's, that there's bucks and there's does, that there's bulls and there's cows, there's lions and there's lionesses, and there's male and female of all these animals, and they're coming in pairs. And Adam realizes something, and maybe one of the more sad verses in the beginning part of the Bible is this, Adam, he, Adam, gave names to all the livestock and the birds of the sky and all the wild animals, but still there was no helper just right for him. And Adam felt it. 
He felt what that loneliness was. And so God, after he named all the animals, he caused Adam to go into a deep sleep because he heard Adam's cry and he took one of the ribs out of Adam's side and from it he crafted woman. And then Adam awoke and I just kind of wonder what that moment was like as he's staring at Eve for the first time. And, and, and I know it was an exciting moment because Adam exclaims, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she is taken out of man. Therefore, uh, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. The two will become one flesh, it says in Genesis 2. And, and it's f crazy because in the Hebrew there, if you kind of look at the Hebrew word, there, it's like an exclamation point could be added to this. There was this wow moment when he saw Eve for the first time. Look at this. This is woman. This is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And then God instituted in that very moment marriage. First institution that God set up was this dream couple, Adam and Eve, in perfect unity in the garden, two becoming one flesh. And a mar the very first marriage took place in the garden. Now, I think that would be just an interesting time in the garden if you could just observe Adam and Eve getting to know one another, right? Because they would have to say, and we would have to agree with them, that when it comes to men and women, there is a lot the same, and there is a lot different, right? Like we look around and we got a lot of the same parts, but then once we get to know one another, there's a lot different. Am I right? Now think back to when you first met your husband or wife. And when you were first dating and you were first getting to know one another and, and, and you're falling in love and I'm guessing the thought crossed your mind like, this is incredible. We have so much in common. We have so much. We like the same things and it's so much fun and they all, I mean, it's great. And then you get married and you say, they're so much different. I mean, I don't understand what they're doing half the time. More than half the time, all the time. What are they? They're so much different now. And so we think about this, that there's so much the same between men and women as far as being human. But there's so much different. And that's usually what causes the rub and what causes marriage problems. Beth and I are one of our favorite um, artists. Uh, his name's Tyrone Wells. And we love listening to Tyrone's music and go to his concerts all the time. And um, he writes love songs. And, and he married uh, a gal who was a recording artist as well. And uh, they put out, quite a few years ago now, they put out this this CD together and they recorded this album together where they, they sang about marriage. And one of the songs they sang was about the differences in marriage. And I'd like you guys to listen to this song just as we kick it off. It's not too, too long of a song, but I think you guys, I think as you listen, you'll, you'll agree that and, and see some of the differences we have in marriage. So can we run that video or that, that song? Do, do, do. Do, 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 do. You've got a little button nose And I've got red hair on my toes You like vegetables and such And I like peanut butter, Captain Crunch You're half Chinese island girl I'm really white and I rock your world You've got Asian chopstick skills And I just love the way you make me feel do, 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 do. As different as can be, but I love you and you love me. Different, different as can be. If you're the land, then I'm, I'm the sea. Do do do, do do do, do do. You wake up right on time. I hit. 
hits news a lot and drive you out of your mind When you wanna watch TV, I bother you until you talk to me When we argue, you get mad Sometimes I cry and I get real sad I clean the windows with Windex You're a boy and all you think about is Different, different as can be If you're the flower that I'm I'm the different, different as can be If you're the land that I'm I'm the sea true that there's just so many differences when it comes to to marriage and and uh but but god if we look at adam and eve we look back to that very first dream couple they were a dream couple they were a power couple because they were dreamed up by god and marriage is meant to be a dream because it was dreamed up by god and god no matter where you walk into the place no matter where your marriage is at as you walk in here, God wants you to have a dream marriage because he designed marriage to be a dream. But sometimes when we do it wrong, it becomes a nightmare. A lot of people have written a lot of quotes about marriage. I like this. There are, some of them were kind of funny. Uh, one says, I love being married, it's so great to find that one special person uh, that you want to annoy for the rest of your life. <laughs> there was uh, um, Winston Churchill, who's the prime minister of, of England, uh, he had this acquaintance who was a, a, um, a lady, and they weren't married or anything, but they were friends, and so they would give each other a hard time, and one time they were at this dinner party, and and, uh, and she kind of took a jab at him, and, and Winston Churchill, you know, kind of jabbed her back. And, and so she said to, to Winston Churchill, said, if you were my husband, I'd put poison in your tea. To which he replied, lady, if you were my wife, I'd drink it. <laughs> Thankfully, there's some wise statements that people have made about marriage as well. Uh, one person wrote, the bonds of matrimony are like any other bonds. They mature slowly. Some of you have known that to be true. Um, I like this one. Remember that a successful marriage depends on two things, finding the right person, and number two, being the right person. And I believe that's so true, and that's why we're talking about here today is because I believe that, that we need to work on ourselves. We need to work on our own um, being the right person. Finally, uh, somebody said this, a successful marriage requires falling in love many times, always with the same person. And I love that. That each day you're waking up and you're falling in more in love with the same person all over again. Proverbs has a lot to share on marriage, and we're just going to hit some quick ones, uh, quick verses before we land in Proverbs 31. Uh, Solomon here, though, uh, the book of Proverbs was written by Solomon, and, and it's interesting that, that Solomon was writing the, the book of Proverbs primarily to his son, um, giving him practical wisdom for life. And so, of course, as a father imparting wisdom to his son, he talks about marriage. And so much of Proverbs comes at it from a male's perspective as a father would give advice to his son. But there's also some really great insights in there for women to be able to glean about men and, and how to relate in marriage. 
Uh, but, but understand that, that much of this was written from uh, Solomon's perspective as he was giving instruction to his son, which is a great little side note just for free that indicates this. Men, if you have children, teach your children how to be uh, great husbands. It's important. It's an important life lesson that you teach them to be husbands. But Proverbs says this, a wife of noble character is uh, her husband's crown, but a disgraceful wife is like decay in his bones. And I believe that this could also be true for husbands as well. A husband of noble character uh, is her, his wife's crown, but a disgraceful husband is like decay in the bones. I think it goes both ways there. It's important, and we're going to talk about that just a little bit, about being a person of noble character. A few verses later, it says this, A man is praised according to his wisdom, but men with warped minds are despised. It's important, men, as we walk in marriage, that we walk in purity of thought as we walk through marriage, because if we have warped minds, it, it affects any and everything. It's important. And women, it's important who you marry and... Um, that you marry a, a wise man. Solomon, as he writes to his son, he often w says things about marriage, but he also then warns about not being uh, promiscuous in marriage or not, uh, not having sexual immorality in marriage and, and to uh, only have eyes for his wife. And so he writes this, may uh, your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. As a loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. Why be captivated, my son, by an adulteress? Why embrace the bosom of another man's wife? For a man's ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all his paths. He's saying, listen, guys, if you're married, he's saying, listen, and he's telling his son, you can hear just his father's like, be delighted, be captivated, be enthralled with your wife. Be delighted in her. Be charmed by her and her alone. Another place in Proverbs, he says, listen, men, if you take another or if you are an adulterer, if you fall into that trap of adultery, he says this, it is like taking hot coals into your lap. Who can be burned? And every man should be like, oh, that does not sound good. And he says that's the same result if you're not faithful to your wife. Proverbs 21 says this, better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and ill-tempered wife. Men do not say amen. <laughs> we'll move on. No, uh, this is true of husbands as well. Um, it's better, and don't be quarrelsome or ill-tempered. It'd be better, to, better for your wife to live in a desert, guys, because that's what you make, her, make them feel like. Proverbs 18, he who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. I love this because God exalts marriage. God wants our marriages to reflect his design and he designed it to be a dream, not a nightmare. But that takes work, friends. And that's why we talk about hard things like this in churches because it, it takes work. Nobody just stumbles into a great marriage and, uh, without any work. It takes diligence. And if you know, if you're in a great marriage, you know it takes work to make it that way. You can't be lazy and have a great marriage. And so he, as we fast forward to Proverbs 31 here, um, he, he's, uh, if you've read through Proverbs 31, you know Proverbs 31. Um, Proverbs 31 is, talks about this uh, worthy woman or an excellent wife or a wife of noble character. But what I find interesting as I was rereading Proverbs 31 is that there was things in there for husbands as well. And it just, Proverbs 31 describes this dream couple. There's a lot of speculation on who this Proverbs 31 woman is and who this couple was, and, and nobody really knows. But Solomon was writing about this worthy woman, this excellent wife, this excellent couple, and laying it out there as um, 
something to be attained. And so, uh, but, but often what happens is when we, when we lay something out there as like, this is something to be uh, looked at, this is something to, to, to go after or chase after, oftentimes when we, we say, well, that seems unattainable, so I'm just going to do, do nothing. I'm just, you know what, that's just, that's just, my marriage is too far gone, we're just, if you knew the circumstances, or you knew my spouse, or, and we just begin to make excuses, and what I want to warn you, or I just want to encourage you today, is I want you to lean as, married couples, I just want you to lean as hard in as you can to God's word, and his challenge for you today, and I want you to not think about your spouse and all that they need to fix, because I'm sure you have the laundry list of what that, that looks like. But I want you to lean hard into what you can do. Like I told our boys all the time uh, when they play baseball, um, uh, control what you can control and leave the rest. Control what you can control and you can control you and what you put in. So I want you to lean hard into what God has for you today, and I want you to be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit's trying to tell you today, not uh, taking notes so that over lunch you can uh, inform your spouse about what you've heard for them today, okay? So can we do that? Let's read Proverbs chapter 31. We're going to pick it up in verse 10. An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and the works uh, with willing hands. She is like the ships of a merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises up while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it with the fruit of her uh, hand. She plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out all at, or go out at night. She puts her hands to the uh, the staff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out for her hands to the needy. Her hands to the needy. She is not afraid to, of snow for her household, uh, sh for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself, and her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known at the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchants. Strength and dignity are, dignity are her clothing. She laughs at a time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and, teach, and uh, the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let, her, uh, let the works praise her uh, in the gates. As we read that, some of these things are very much um, uh, timed, right? Like we read and we're like, well, I don't, uh, I don't deal much in flax and seed anymore, so uh, I'm not really sure that any of this applies to me, Joel. I don't make my bed linens anymore. I just go to the Target and buy them. You know, uh, what, what's going on? And I understand that a lot of this is uh, dated by time, um, but what we shouldn't miss in the midst of all this being dated in time and, and some of those things is... Is the, the principles that are there. The principles for men and women, the principles for husbands and wives. As I read through that earlier this week, I, I, there, there's, there was 12 qualities of um, uh, uh, the man and, and woman here in, in, uh, in Proverbs chapter 31 that, that described, and then I thought, you know what, we don't want to be here till all day, uh, so I better narrow this down a little bit, because uh, we can't go through 12, and so as we read through this, um, we got three qualities, um, and I just got to just say, just as a time out a little bit, um, this is kind of a special message for me, because, um, and, and this is a, a message that my dad wrote, um, and one of the most special um, marriages that I've ever got to witness 
um, and just the wisdom that he poured into my life um, before I was a husband and as I was a husband early in our marriage, the wisdom that he poured into my life about what it looks like to be a, a man and a husband. Um, and so as I was thinking about Proverbs, I had remembered this, this message that he wrote um, and this outline, and, and I changed it and I put a little of my own flair in it, like, you know, how I do. But, uh, but this is his outline, and so this is a really special uh, message to me. Um, for those of you who knew my dad, well, here's some uh, Pastor Dave um, wisdom for you as well. Um, I called time out, so time back in. Okay. Uh, three, three qualities that we want to, that, that are in a dream marriage. First, you could write this in as excellent character. Excellent character. Proverbs 31, verse 10 says it like this. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. She's worth far more than rubies. And I believe that this is true in both ways. For a man and a, 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 a husband of noble character, who can find? Worth far more than rubies. And, and friends... Uh, being married now, last week I wasn't here, Jason was preaching because Beth and I were out celebrating our 12th anniversary and been married 12 years and, and man, I found this to be so, so, so true um, of Beth. A, a wife of noble character is worth so much more than any riches in the world. Uh, rubies were just a, a, a wealth thing, they were just money, just, you know, so picture millions of dollars if somebody said, Joel, I'll give you millions of dollars, but you have to give up Beth, I'd be like, no way. No way, that's not even, that's not even a thought. You're like, Joel, you're just saying that. Come on, like millions of dollars. No, I wouldn't. Because I understand that a woman of noble character, a godly, God-fearing woman is worth more than any amount of money that could be offered. And when you find somebody that's full of character, that, that's full of godliness, that's full of wisdom, they are worth so much more value, whether it's your husband or your wife. We need to strive after excellent character because it's worth more than any amount of money. There was this sales guru one time. They'd come in and they, this company had hired him to come in and and uh, just get everybody excited about, um, about sales and, and fire them up to, to go into the next quarter and, and make all these sales. And this sales guru gets in front of all these salesmen and he, he, uh, he pulls out a stack of $100 bills equaling $10,000 and he, he holds it up and he says, there is nothing more valuable than money. There is nothing more valuable than this. He's like, I will give this $10,000 to anyone who can, who, can, who can tell me that of anything worth more than money. And it was quiet. And this old gentleman stood up in the back. And he said, sir, with all due respect, what money can't buy, money can't buy a baby's smile. Money can't buy unconditional love. Money can't buy forgiveness. Money can't buy heaven. Money can't buy faith. And money can't buy character. And sir, you can keep your money. And he sat down. You see, there's things that money can't buy. And, and one of those things is character is someone who lives with integrity in their life, who walks in character. And what Solomon is saying, when you find somebody that has character, they are worth more than any amount of money that could ever be offered because you can have trust in them and you can know that there's nothing between you. I love what this uh, Proverbs 31 says about the husband. He says, her husband is respected at the city gates where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. In other words, this, this man in Proverbs 31, he was a man who was respected by all the townspeople. He was a judge. And what, uh, what sitting by the city gates was is that the men would, respected men of the, 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 the town would go sit at the city gates and they would act as judges in the affairs of the city. And this man was of such high esteem that as he walked around the city, they're like, oh, there's so-and-so. There's so-and-so. 
oh, he's here, we can finally have a, 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 a wise decision being made. So this couple here in Proverbs 31, she was a woman of noble character. He was a, a man of noble character. And as they walked around the city, they were known amongst the town as, as a couple who had character, who was respected by the people they walk amongst. Let me ask you, as you walk in your circle of friends, are you known by your circle of friends as a couple who has character? who is well respected by those people who are around because you're, you're a couple, you're individually people of character and you together, they know that when you show up on the scene, character comes with it, integrity comes with it, wisdom comes with it, respect comes with it. So interesting. Um, character, character development, um, uh, we've always recognized that as an important part of of raising youth, right? Um, when I was in high school um, at Barlow, there was, uh, it was right in this time where um, they started this respect movement in, in the high schools, and, and they, they did these, um, they, would, they would pull us out of class and, and do these uh, assemblies where they would talk about respect, and, and they'd talk about different aspects of character. Well, I found out later that, that there was this, and there still is this, um, the website you can go on to, and it's called Character Counts. And, and this, whole, this website is a training for young people that, that they can uh, teach character development. And, and they identified six qualities that define good character. And they are this, resp uh, responsibility, trustworthiness, citizenship, caring, fairness, and respect. Responsibility, trustworthiness, citizenship, caring, fairness, respect. Does that define the way you live? The way you interact in your marriage? The way you interact with your spouse? Because that's a good snapshot kind of of what character looks like within a marriage. Character is important. And being men and women, Proverbs identifies it now several times that being men and women of character is vital for having a dream marriage because trust is built on that character. The second thing you can write this in, the second quality is serve one another in love. Serve one another in love. And you can, that kind of, um, as I was thinking about this idea of serving our spouse, serving one another in marriage, it really kind of comes out in two different ways I saw this, um, this week. One is first in action. And this is the one that kind of comes naturally to mind, right? That we, when we serve one another, it's, it's serving is doing things for others, right? It's serving, it's, it's, it's in action and, and going out of our way to, to bless one another. Um, and, and as you read through this section in Proverbs 31, you notice that how many times it talked about um, the woman doing things and, and working and serving her home and her family and her husband, right? Um, over and over and over, it, it, it talks about that. In verse 11 and 12, though, it says this, uh, her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. What a, what a statement that, that Solomon was saying about this excellent woman, this excellent wife, that, listen, she, she interacts with her family in such a, an incredible way that, that, she, that her husband lacks nothing, and, and she brings good and not harm. And this goes much more to the idea of not what you do, but how you do it, and how you serve, and the heart behind service, and how you walk through this. If you read through this verse or these sections again, it describes this activity. And in verse, uh, we'll get to it in, in just a minute again, but in verse uh, 27, it says this, she looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. And I, I'm just gonna, don't worry women, I'm gonna press your husbands in just a minute. I'm just gonna press in a little bit though on you. And, in love, because I was thinking about what is the bread of idleness for us today? 
Friends, the bread of idleness is this. And so often we get spent so much time right here looking at our Instagram, our Facebooks, our whatever on this. And we are looking at this rather than our husband. Women, your husbands. And it's, I'll tell you, wives, I'll just, because I've talked to men and I've heard this more than once, that this is, is killing your husbands inside. Because as you are scrolling through Instagram and focusing on how you're going to take the next picture or updating your story, your, men, your man is over there dying inside for your attention. And I've heard that from more than one man in this church. And so I don't mean to be a jerk or anything like this, but I want to press a little bit because I think this is important that the, that the bread of idleness isn't, it has a lot to do with this or what we're watching or and I'm not saying you have to work your fingers to the bone and, and that your husband should come in and be demanding and has, they have the right to be demanding. They don't. But you can bless your husband so much, women, by focusing on them. And maybe it's not this for you, but maybe it's something else. Maybe it's distractions. Maybe it's, maybe it's your, maybe it's family. Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's, the housework that you're obsessed with because you have to have a perfectly clean house and while your husband's there dying inside for your attention. Now men, Ephesians chapter five, Paul talks about, talks to men and he says that husbands, you are to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy and blameless and radiant. <laughs> I'll ask you this question, men, just because I've asked it to you before, but I think it's so important. Men, by the way you are loving and serving your spouse, your wife, are you making her more beautiful, more holy, and more radiant? Or have you slacked off? When you walk in the home, and I understand men, you, you work long, but when you walk in the home, are you giving your best to your family or have you given your best to the nine to five, to the boss, and you walk in and you sit like a duff on the couch and you expect to be served? That's not loving your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. You know what Christ did for the church? He died for the church. That's the kind of self, that's the sign of selflessness and sacrifice that he gave for the church. And men, I just don't think that you should give your best to your job and let your family suffer when you walk in the door. I think you should give your best to your family because that's where it really counts. That's what really matters. And so often you are consumed in your jobs and your wife is dying on the inside and your kids are dying for you to play with them. So when you walk in the house, men, are you walking in and looking at the craziness of what's just taken place? And I, I'll, I'll tell you guys, I understand this. I walk in and sometimes it looks like a bomb went off in our house because we have three little bombs in our house, Caleb, Callie, and Kelsey. And Kelsey is the biggest bomb of them all. And it just is an explosion. And it's tempting to want to go sit down and watch TV. And it's tempting to want to just relax and un unwind a little bit. But what's more important, men, is you come in and you begin to look how you can bless and serve your wife and your kids. To come in and begin saying, what needs to be cleaned? Are there dishes that can be done? Is there, does she need help with a meal? Can we sit together and cook together and laugh together? Do I need to give her a moment? How can I get down on the floor and play with my kids or go out back and play with them? These are important things that we serve one another in action because love is, there is nothing passive about the word love. And so often we say, yeah, I love you, but yet we're so passive in what, the way we exemplify that that it really can't even be called love anymore because love is always active. Guys, we have got to begin to serve one another. 
go out of our way. What did Jesus do? Our, our ultimate example is Jesus, isn't it? In everything in life, our ultimate example is Jesus. And what did Jesus do over and over and over and over? He served and served and served and served. And when he didn't feel like serving anymore, he went into an upper room. Before he was going to die, he took off his outer garment, put on a towel, and began to wash his disciples' feet. He served in action. And husbands and wives, one of the best things we can do is serve in action. I got to go because I could talk about this all day. The second way we can serve one another is in speech. In, in speech. So many times we don't think about this aspect of serving one another. But when we talk to one another, are we serving one another with what we're saying? Is it what's beneficial for them? Or is it what's beneficial to appease our anger or appease our selfishness or appease our just needing to get it off our chest? I love what, it's not directly in, in relation, or in said in the context of marriage, but, but it is because it's about relationship. Paul writes this, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. And so often we write that off, it's like, I don't cuss my spouse out. Like, I don't cuss at him, so obviously I'm following this one, right? Unwholesome talk is not just that, but notice what he says, don't let any unwholesome talk out of your mouth, but only, only, the only thing that should be coming out of our mouth is what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Does that describe the way you talk to your spouse? Because we could be saying the truth, but if it's not beneficial in the moment or helpful for building each other up or said in love, then friends, it's unwholesome talk. And he says, don't let it come out of your mouth. It's unwholesome if it's not designed to bring wholeness. Are your words bringing life or death? Are they building one another up? I love what is said about this woman in Proverbs 31, an incredible statement. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Oh, to for all of us to as ascribe to be that. That whenever we open our mouth, wisdom and teaching of kindness comes forth. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her, encourages her, builds her up. Guys, sometimes... What's left unsaid is more devastating than what we do say. Are we singing the praises of our wife? Do all of our friends, do all of our friends know how awesome our wives are in our minds? Because we've just talked about how great they are so often. Women, do, you, do all your best friends know how much you love your, and, and adore and respect your husband because of the way that you talk about them? Or do they think that they're a piece of work because of the way you talk about them? One of the best pieces of advice we got before we were married is to always speak well of each other when we're in public, when we're with, with other people, with our friends, to speak well of our, our husband and wife. Build one another up according to to what they need. We can bring life with our tongue or we can bring death with our tongue. It's important to bring life. There was a story of this, true story of this woman who had gotten married to a man and um, he was a pretty overbearing man and um, he would leave for work and he would he, he would write out lists of things that he wanted her to accomplish before she, he got home from work. And if he didn't, she didn't get those things done before he got home, she, he, would, he would berate her and belittle her over it. And it was devastating. This, this man, um, at 35 years old, he contracted cancer 
and died a year later. About five years later after that, she met a man, a godly man who loved her. And they fell in love and they got married. And it was a completely different thing. He just loved her like Christ loved the church and gave himself and served her. And, and she was up in the attic going through boxes of things and um, old things one day and she ran across one of the lists that her ex that her previous her first husband had written and she just sat down and began to weep because she realized that everything on that list she was doing for her husband now but she was doing so out of a place of love and not obligation friends when you begin to serve one another in marriage and your goal when you walk in is to serve one another like Christ served and that you go out of your way and you just, you just make it part of your life and a challenge, can you outserve the other one? Can you love the other one in, in a deeper, more passionate way every single day? Friends, it's incredible what begins to happen and the excitement that gets brewed in you and stirred in your marriage. Serve one another in love. And thirdly, have a foundation of love. Have a foundation of love. I love that. So he said this, right? Um, the verse 28 ends with her children rise up and call her blessed and her husband also. And he praises her. And this is what he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass all of them. It's incredible. You can just sense in this how much he loves her how much he cherishes and he says it and he proclaims it. He affirms it, say it, act it out, your love for one another. It's important to have the right priorities in love though. And we've said this here before, we say it again, Pastor Dave said it so many times and I say it because it's so, so, so important that we get the right priorities. Love God first, love each other next, and then love your children. So many times this gets out of whack. And the problem is, is if we try to love our spouse first before God, you essentially make them God and they're never equipped to be God. Don't make them God. They will fail you every time. Make God, leave God in the number one spot. Love God first. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. And then after that, love your spouse with everything you... And then after that, prioritize your kids. And then after that, down the list comes everything else. Down the list after that comes extended family work, uh, um, ministry, prior other priorities, sports, whatever that is, comes after these three things. But friends, the best, husbands and wives, the best thing you can give to your kids is to love your spouse. Love your spouse. Show them that. If you are married, God's design is for you to have a dream marriage. Not, not primarily for your own enjoyment, but to declare his glory and his goodness over your life. The secondary benefit of that is it's awesome <laughs> to have a dream marriage. It's great. But the primary reason, the primary purpose of living out these things is that over, so that over your marriage, God is glorified and that God's uh, glory is reflected in your life. I was talking to, I, I share this with most um, people that I do marriage counseling with and then pre-marriage counseling with. Um, we're all familiar with the, the, the honeymoon period of marriage, right? And where everybody's like, oh, it's so wonderful and so great. And, and, then, and then reality hits. Um, here's why the, the honeymoon period ends. is because you stop doing the things that you were doing in the honeymoon period that helped the honeymoon period be as great as it was. And let me tell you this. If you continue to do what you did in the honeymoon period every day, and you live that 
practical love out, that excited practical love every single day and you pour into your spouse and you serve one another and you, you live in that sweet spot of, of trying to outserve one another in actions and in speech and you begin to love one another in the way that they experience love, I'm telling you, friends, the honeymoon phase doesn't have to end. And I think if we're honest, why would we want it to? <laughs> I don't want it to. That's fun. It's exciting. There's romance. There's, and I'm not saying you're not going to go through dry spells, but when you're in a dry spell, and some of you may, may be in a, a tight spot right now, in a tough spot right now, go back to doing the things that you did that made things great, primarily in, or if they are from God's word. Go back to the foundation of focusing on yourself, focusing on your character. Go back to the foundation of serving one another in speech and in action, and I'll add in intimacy. Go back to that spot and then prioritize, set the right priorities in your life. God first, don't expect your spouse to be God. They can't do it. They'll fail you every time. If you don't expect it, though, if you expect them to be second priority, it works out great. But never, never place anything, including your children, above your spouse in priority in your family. It goes south every single time. And your kids don't even like it anyway. If you go back to that spot, friends, you will see the dream become back, come back and the nightmares seem to go away. God's word has a lot to say about marriage because it was God's design. It was the very first institution that a man should leave his father and mother and be united with his wife and the two should become one flesh. And what God joins together, let no man separate. That's the dream. And I believe it's possible if we live according to the biblical principles of marriage. So that's my challenge for you. I hope you found yourself somewhere in this marriage, found some, or somewhere in this sermon, and are like, you know what, I can work on that. I can work on that this week. And let the conviction of the Holy Spirit work on your spouse. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for today. And God, I, pray, I just want to pray a prayer of blessing over every marriage in this church. I just pray, I pray and ask that you would do an incredible work this week. And no matter how, when people came in here, um, no matter what the state of their marriage was, God, I pray that, that, that we would all press into what you have called us. Lord, may we, may we love one another as you call us to love one another so that the ultimate picture, so that your glory may be displayed in our marriage and that your wisdom would guide and direct our marriages. Jesus, we need your help in this area. And so we pray for grace and blessing over every marriage in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen.